going to start off with uh, our very own American coach, uh, Heather Moody. Uh, I obviously can speak a lot about Heather's accomplishments as a player, uh, but most recently uh, what we should all be uh, grateful for and congratulate her on is uh, this gold medal in 2012 in London. So uh, as she comes up here, uh, not only should we greet her uh, as she begins her presentation on center defense and, and centers, but we should also uh, Give her our, from the, on behalf of the coaches in America, our heartfelt congratulations on winning the gold medal for us uh, this summer. So, Heather Moody, everybody. Um, first, thanks for having me come out. Uh, this is really exciting. Enjoy. Not really the highlight of the coaching because it's not on the pool deck, so this makes it a little bit more difficult and out of our my comfort zone. But. Um, Today is the center defender, and a majority of everything that you're going to hear has been done. Um, I played with it, and I coach the skills. So Ellen, who is my counterpart in the center part um, de department in 2000 and 2004, uh, did a lot of the center work that we're going to talk about. If you have any questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to ask. You don't have to wait till the end. Kind of open, pretty mellow presentation. Um, just a couple of things that are make a good center. Uh, overall strength. Uh, that the overall strength is like your physical body makeup and then also your mental makeup. Makeup. Um, you just need that mental capacity in this position. And the major component that we as water polo players is our leg strength. And the centers, it's crucial that you have leg strength because you're going to be holding up a defender and trying to hold position. The other area that's really important is your vision, knowing where the ball is the whole entire time and being able to read and adapt to where the ball is if you have to change your positioning. And then patience. Patience is vitally important as a center because there's times you want the ball and there's no way it's going to get in there and you lose position and then you have to be patient enough to just counteract and wait for your opportunity and then attack. Um, the ability to play in the now. Um, it was talked about a little bit this morning in the Positive Coaching Alliance, but to like his comment was flush, flush it. You had a bad possession, you got an offensive call, whatever the situation is, but just being able to play in that moment because as a center, you're not gonna get all the calls that you were looking for or hoping for and there's a turnover and you have to immediately start chasing and playing defense. You can't take a moment, pout, and then start to go back on defense. So playing in the now, um, a controlled intensity, knowing when it's the time to be aggressive and then when it's the time to being mellow and waiting for that opportunity. So that goes back to your patience. And then back again to mental toughness because you never really know how the game is gonna be called with the referees. The games could be t called really tight. A team could be playing zone the whole entire time. So you could play a whole entire, entire game and not touch the ball. Um, so those are some qualities that make the a good center. Responsibilities of the center is to gain the ball side position. And then the other is like maintaining that ball side position. So you're relying on your perimeter players to get to the ball to the side of the pool that you want to hold. And once that happens, it's now your responsibility to maintain that. And then when the ball is coming in, is an explosive move towards that ball so you can cause the referee, get the referee's attention to make a call, give you an exclusion, get the separation that you need to get the shot off, or just get an ordinary foul. Positioning on the centers. <clears throat> Establish and maintain the ball side position by keeping contact with the defender. This is important at the center position. Later when we're talking about the defensive position, I'm going to counteract with this comment. But as a center, you want the defender's chest. Because then you can feel their movement and you can make sure that you're able to counteract what they're about to do. When they have the separation and they only have their hands on your back, it's a lot harder to feel where they're going to be moving or jumping to, so it's a little bit harder to read. So if you're able to establish and maintain that ball side position and keep the contact with the defender, you're going to be a lot more successful. Centers must know their position in front of the cage. A lot of times there's players that are taking shots outside the post because we don't know where we are in the, in the cage. So in relationship to the cage, that location in the pool is really, really important. The ideal location is at the three meter line center cage. Doesn't happen all the time, but it's ideal. Anything else? Any questions? 
Um, base position. On the base position, the way that we teach it in the, the situation is it's basically like you're sitting in a chair. And you have your back slightly hunched, your chin is to your chest, shoulders are out of the water, slightly exposed, elbows are high, and your hands are scrolling. And the reason that we do this is your body position is like you're just able to hold that positioning and you have an, a higher percentage of snapping and getting the separation and being over your legs. So when you're in that chair, your knees are high and you think about and the, the points that I always like to teaching points to kids is taking your hip bones and your rib cage and squishing it together. And you're making that curve in your back, the ideal curve, because that forces your shoulders to roll forward. You bring that hips and you want to maintain your hips over your leg, like you don't want them in front or behind. So thinking about like taking those hip bones and the rib cage and just squishing them together as like just a good teaching point so they can think about like just small little things. The chin to the chest, it eliminates an offensive foul. You're not throwing your head back. You're going to have your chin to your chest, and especially when you're snapping and getting that separation. It's everything's going forward towards that ball. Shoulders out of the water, just getting the referee's attention, exposing what they're, what's happening to them from the defender's standpoint. I like the elbows raised, and they're parallel with your shoulders because it makes you wider. You're not narrow because then that defender can get around you a little bit more. You're nice and wide and big, and you're covering your responsibility. And then you're also able to dip and move a little bit to cover more water if the defender's moving more. <clears throat> Reestablishing that base position. So in the center position, our, our hips are down, we're vertical. Defensively, you're going to be horizontal. You're going to lose that battle. That defender is going to be able to push you out of your position, your ideal position in front of that cage. To reestablish that, so or if you're losing your contact with that defender, the way it's a quarter turn. And so if the, if the defender's behind me and they have my full back to push on, so, I have my, so I'm in my base position, I'm square to the ball, I'm waiting for the ball to come in, I'm getting pushed out. So instead of turning and swimming, it's that quarter turn. And the comment that like it's, I'm wide and then I'm narrow. I'm, it's harder just to, now they only have a shoulder to push on. And then with that, after that quarter turn, it's an explosive breaststroke kick getting into that dinner, the defenders underneath the armpit, bringing back and getting into that base position. So if Brenda's my defender, and she's pushing, and so I'm getting pushed out and out of position, I can easily slip getting narrow, and I can breaststroke kick diving back underneath, snap my shoulders square, and I'm back into my base position, regaining water that I lost. Does that make sense? Face-to-face -face positioning. So most of the teams that we play against, they start in a press. And to kind of conserve energy, with the center position, we start in a face-to-face -face position. So they are in front. The defender takes position, they're in a front position, we're gonna go into a face-to-face. -face. That's facing your defender, arm to arm, maintaining space between you. You don't wanna be really tight because then you lose your momentum of driving back into that defender and making the defender back away and reposition. So you wanna maintain a good distance between, but your arm and arm, bicep, tricep area is the ideal place that you're grabbing. Then the reasons, is you're gonna grab, you're gonna turn, spin, and seal. But you're gonna be there in this position for the sight line to the ball. You're gonna conserve your energy. And especially for the women, it protects our suit because that zipper is so nice just to be able to control everyone. The turn, spin, and seal. The, movements need, the movement needs to be powerful and explosive. You're actually going into that defender trying to gain a little inch of water, making them have to backpedal and reposition. If it's just a casual, then they're able to reposition or even jump in front and maintain that front position. The turn, it centers inside arm to the cage. So the arm, so if the cage is behind me, it's this arm that's closest, the ball's over on this side of the pool, it's that inside arm to the outside armpit of the defender. I'm gonna pull that defender and put my shoulder on that defender's armpit. Drop, and then you're gonna beat. The next step is turn, spin, and the spin and seal. Oops. <clears throat> this spin is just the. I always, for like younger kids, I like to say you're putting up a roadblock. 
you're putting your body in position as a roadblock to block that defender from repositioning and getting in front. So like if I'm here and we're face to face, the ball gets to the side of the pool that I'm getting to like the, I, now it's my turn to go to work. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna go my turn, spin and seal. So at this point, my spin, I've just put up the roadblock. So now that defender is trapped behind me. So I'm protecting, that's the ball, me, and now the defender. So that positioning is mine. I own this water in front of me. The seal. <clears throat> is where you're sealing off, you're getting your back, in, your back into that center position, you're establishing your base position, you're maintaining ball side. And then the other areas, like the defender, you're gonna move. They're gonna reposition. So if they start to reposition, an ideal point and a controlling area is from the armpit to the hip of the defender. So if I have my hands out wide and the defender's moving to my left, I can actually just hook a little bit underneath that armpit and I can help pull my body and bring my chair with me. So I don't lose my base position. So if the ball does come in, I can react to that ball. So controlling that defender from the armpit to the hip with small little movements just to maintain that body position. Oh, I did it again. So just gaining the, the ball side. So if the defender starts ball side, the center would start in a face-to-face. -face. So we're going through this. So they're fronting. The defender's taught to be fronting. So you're maintaining your sight line. You're gonna turn, spin, and seal when the ball gets to the side that you're holding. The window of work that we wanna work is only three to five seconds. So you can be as explosive as possible. That's ideal, it doesn't always happen. You could be in that center base position for a while, especially if they fall into a zone, and then you have to work on spreading that zone. <clears throat> you have to also anticipate the center entry pass. And that like deals with like your relationship with your perimeter players, knowing them, knowing what, what they have or how it happens. Friend and I had a good relationship and she's a great center entry pass. It was something that like you saw and you knew it was coming. So then that was the anticipation. So then you were able to snap to the ball and get great separation. Any questions?
of the ball right here. So it's like working with each athlete to learn to do the center entry pass, but then the centers are getting the repetition that they need to learn the different tactics. But it just, I think it's just time. And I know that like at the club level, because there's constant changeover, and then especially like in the universities and colleges and stuff, it's the only thing that we have a small window to work with each athlete. And so I think in certain situations, on the younger side, it's teaching them to actually read the ball more instead of reading the player. And so it's like keeping your eye and anticipating and watching the ball. And that's like something that, and then when you do get into the more elite and you have that time frame, it's gonna be, okay, I can play off of Brooks. But it's really just watching the ball and maintaining that sight line and knowing the timing of it getting to the side of the pool that you wanna hold. And so then you go to work and then the timing of when that ball is leaving that net. Explain the mechanics of getting out of the front. How would you get out of the front? Say the ball is on one of your side or something like that. On the front, so we were talking, this is, well, I, this is, is easier for me. There, so if Brent is fronting me, like yeah. the ideal on, on the ball is behind us. And so if the ball is over on this side of the pool, I'm not going to give it numbers because everyone's is different. Um, <laughs> the ball's on this side of the pool, and Brenda has that front position. Right. And even if it's up on the higher, the up in this situation, one of the tactics that you can do with center, instead of like stopping or like on counterattack, stopping out at five meters, because then that pushes your next offensive line so far back, and she's ready and waiting, get to the two meter line. Get her a little bit deep, she'll take the front position, and then once you get to this position, you can move her out at a 45 degree angle. And that, but you want to go at a 45 degree angle because you don't want to go her strength against your strength. Because then you're not really going to go anywhere. Legs against legs. If you move her out at a 45 degree angle, sorry. One, she might not realize how far she's going. So then the ball comes over. There's a skip pass. It gets down deep. Or if we're on this side, I can go inside arm, outside arm, hip turn, spin, and peel. Now I have a 45 degree angle to the water. The ball can land here. I have inside water. And it's a simple, and it's a 45 degree angle. If you have, because a lot of a lot of people, is, oh, she's waiting for me. She's in her front. Still a counterattack. If the ball is in the position to hit the center at that time, so I'm coming down the pool, the ball is already deep, I can stop early and go to work here. So you're going to have a quicker transition. If the ball is still at the goalie, get down the two, set it up, 45 degree angle, move her out, and then go from there. And it gives you just a different, it's an easier path from the, 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 the one, two, four, five side. Because even if I'm in this position and John has the ball, he can place it in here and I have water to work with. Another area that you can work on is if you have a center that's over aggressive and they're anticipating the pass. So the Italians are really good at this. They like they anticipate the pass and will jump early. So if the Brenda, if the ball starts over here and she's in front position, I'm in face to face. And even if I'm in face to face, it doesn't always have to be here. Drill wise, have it be here because it teaches the movement of what they're going to be doing and forcing them. But in a game, more game like, it's going to end up like this, most likely. So just and then from here, you can still do the same movement. Or if it's a player that's going super high side, I can just reverse it because I'm going to put up my roadblock. And it forces the defender to come back to the inside, and I can spin back this way. So it's that roadblock of making and forcing that defender. So it's like almost the game. Your move is going to dictate what their move is going to be. You don't want it to be a wrestling match. You want it to be a dance and a transition. So here, she's moving out. And the ball is over. short side move. So I'm going to do a crossover, basically a crossover this way, give this defender this, back to that 45 degree angle, now I have ball skip position. Who do you like to do that communication? The center defender or the goalie to say who should be pressed and who uh... Ooh. Well, we're on sprinters first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the pictures are a little bit later. <laughs> but uh, to answer that, it would be the defender. The defender is the one that's going to be dictating what's happening. And the, the, the perimeter defense and the defender have to work together. Because
because the thing is, is when they're prepping, there can't be a skip pack. Because once there's a skip pack, they're, they're screwed. <laughs> but did that answer that? Very well, thank you. Anything else? <coughs> no, no, good, thank you. Um, so on here, it's the move the 45 degree angle. So on this one, this is a, like the verbiage of like spinning back towards the cage. So if the defender has moved too far away from the goal or it begins to move to the inside. So like you're taking, you're out at five meters. As a defender, you're taught to come back to the inside and start pushing out. So to counteract that, you can spin back towards the cage to seal them off and still maintain your ball side position. If you're not able to spin, like if the defender is like swimming or has a quicker stroke and they cover a lot more water than what your spin does, you can actually match their stroke. And then once you're swimming in, take the hand closest to the ball. So if the ball is over here with John and I'm swimming back to, I take the hand closest to where that ball is and I'm going to spin back in because I'm always putting up the roadblock. If you always think about putting your body as the blocking, that roadblock, then they're going to be able to maintain that ball side position. Uh, we demonstrated the short side technique, but it's just when that defender over anticipates everything. Um, drawing a foul. One of the things, especially even at the junior level, is like just maintaining your base position. It's really hard. One of the things, it's like a lot of defenders, what they'll do is they'll start pushing on your hips to get your hips out of position because your hips are supposed to be underneath. If that's happening, just do like a quick little breaststroke kick and it's gonna help drive your hips back. You don't wanna do a constant breaststroke kick because then that establishes a rhythm and it makes it really easy for a defender to jump around. So the idea is like with those quick explosive breaststroke kicks, it's to drive your hips back into that base position and then you can maintain your positioning. Um, absorb the contact. A lot of times you, it's, they'll go underwater so then it's a no call from the referee and you gotta keep your head up. Because if your head's up, most likely you're going to know where the ball is. And then the biggest thing in an area that we're struggling on, just with the national teams, is snapping to the ball. And the snap to the ball is crucial. And what that thing, what it is, is it creates, it, it creates so much. It causes the referees to look because you're actually making that move to the ball, exposing what the defender's doing. But then it also opens up a shooting lane. And on that snap, it's basically... You're in your base position, you're gonna drive your left shoulder into that defender's chest, making your arms this much longer, your shoulder length longer, but you've really gotta step with your right leg or if you're left-handed, your left leg and scoop water and cover and be on your blades. A lot of times when we're snapping or we're trying to move to the ball, we don't take our chair, so we don't have our base and there's nothing behind it. So if the defender over commits one way or the other, I don't have my leg base to finish my shot. Some shooting factors, a big one, where the defender is. It's going to dictate what your shot is. Um, if they're behind you, if they're in the front position, on the side, it really depends on what they are and how it's really going to dictate what positioning and what your shots are. <clears throat> um, where am I in relationship to the goal? So we talked about how important the goal is. Am I on left? Am I in the center? Am I at four meters, five meters? If you t try to take a quarter turn out at five meters, it's a hard shot to finish. And, or if you're at two meters, it's going to be a high percentage. And then the other one is what type of center entry pass. Because you know that they're going to sometimes be a beeline to your face. Um, sometimes they're going to be really good. And sometimes they're going to be super short. Or you might have to catch it out of the air and try to control it. So that's where it's like watching the ball and seeing if you can anticipate and react to that ball so you can control it so it's not necessarily always a turnover with a bad pass. Any more questions on the centers? How do you, how do you anticipate the drop and then the kick out? Most likely? I mean the kick out pass, I'm sorry. I said kick out, kick out pass. Like just re, like putting it back into play? Right. Well, you, Coming in there attacking, and you've got to make sure you're not going to get a shot off. So, what mechanics do you go through? I think the thing is, is like there, I, it's the mechanics are exactly the same. There, nothing changes from that point. And that's the point where I like. This is why I like to coach 
in this style is because every single thing is exactly the same. Everything that you do in the center position starts out of your base. So if you're in your base position, you're going to be able to react to whatever's coming. And the biggest thing is, is it's like, once you're in your base position, you turn, spin, and seal, and they fall back into a zone, you can read that zone. So now your job in the center position is to spread that zone. So you've gotten the honor, you, you, uh, the defense honors you as a center, so they're going to fall back and not let the ball come into you. So now to help out your teammates, I've got to try to move across the cage. And one of the things is, is like making sure that like it's not always back to the two-meter line, because if you're deep, you, just, you need to move across the cage to draw those defenders to see how far they're actually going to go. If they don't follow, then that pass can come in. If someone's crashing, you can visually see that because you're on your base, you're on your legs, and you can see that, and you can know you're going to have to snap, move the ball away, and a nice outlet pass. Can you talk about the ways Uh, the defender is the most important component of the half-court defense. Uh, great defenders will determine the defense played against the opponent. So they're dictating what's going to be played. So they're the ones that are able to actually set the tone of how the game is going to be played out. Um, a great defender will have the capacity to physically fatigue the, an opponent's center. And then the defender contributes to the offense by creation by the creation of counterattack opportunities. Because most of the time, centers are a little bit slower. They're probably going to be a little bit more fatigued because it's a hard position. And so they have like that great, and then our, the defenders have that opportunity to create great opportunities on the counterattack. So then they have to also have good perimeter outside shooting. Um, and then the other component is they're probably going to be a major fo a focal point on the transition. So nothing's generated on the counterattack, so they're the ones that are probably going to be reading that and knowing where they need to get the ball because you have to locate the center on that counterattack. 
Um, the objective of the defender is to neutralize the center. Um, gaining and maintaining ball side position for as long as possible. Off of the transition, off of counterattack, you want to know where they are. You want to match up with the center around the latest, the nine meter line. So you're already in that front position because then that's going to show your teammates, your, defend, your defensive players around the perimeter that we're already in our press and they don't have to worry about it. Um, use the ball, the ball side positioning to force the center away from the cage and then establish the inside position. And so knowing where you are in the cage, your positioning, your geography, two meter line, three meter line, four meter line, knowing when to come behind. Because if you can get that center out at five meters and you can quickly get to the inside and keep them out there, your zone doesn't have to be as active and as deep. So then that helps you out and then that should be, your goal is to be in a zone maybe for 10 seconds. Um, physically and like you physically fatigue the center, center by always being hard to defend. So it's like you have a job of like getting them tired and playing position defense at the defensive end, but then your other job is to make sure that they have to work on the counterattack and then they have to defend you on their half court defense. So making sure that you are always engaged into the game. Um, what makes a good defender? Back to our leg strength. Leg strength is crucial. Um, patience. Being a defender, you have to be patient because there's things that are constantly changing and you have to be able to react to them and that patience of just knowing when to go to work is going to be crucial. Uh, you have to be creative. There's, you're going to be held and you're going to be moved and you got to be creative and use all the skills that you have and make it work. Um, we'll cover a couple areas of like trying how to front and then there's combinations of how people, which ones work better for other people. Um, anticipation. You got to anticipate, kind of anticipate where that ball's moving, what that center player is going to be doing, and try to like beat them to that positioning. Back to that dance. Nice, easy, but they, now the defenders want to be the lead dancer and set the tone. Uh, got to be a good vertical shooter. Uh, change body positions quickly. You could be in a vertical position when you're spinning around to snapping up and being back into your horizontal position, staying away in good base position. Uh, back to another controlled intensity. Yeah, there's times that you have to be aggressive and take that exclusion and make sure that the center remembers that it's an exclusion and then there's some times where it's, it's just mellow and you're waiting for that zone to come steal the ball. Vision, knowing where the ball is at all time. Mental toughness, this one's crucial. Mental toughness in the defender position is important because you could get an exclusion in the first 30 seconds of the game and you're sitting on the bench and you might have to be there until after halftime. And you have to be engaged and staying engaged and making sure that you're supportive of your teammates and that's in, or you can make it the whole entire game without an exclusion. So just being able to adapt to that. And then the biggest one that I think is really, really important is being able to communicate. And it's communicating with the perimeter defense and then also with your goalie. Your goalie's going to help you and what your positioning is and if they're going to be able to come out and help you out. <coughs> uh, responsibilities. Gain the ball side position by the defensive nine meter line. Maintain ball side as long as possible. Win behind, establish inside position and communicate. So you know, your teammates know, and that could be early communication. On some of that, it's like half the time, you know you're pinned. I mean, if you think about your fronting and you're in that front position and that center has you, they have a hold of your suit, they know that the next pass you're going to get behind, you can sit there and go, Brenda, it's you. I need you next. So Brenda knows that she needs to foul the ball quickly and drop, or she knows she just needs to come back and help me out. So it's that early communication that's going to make you a good defender. And it's, help, it's a huge responsibility. Um, there's no, on the national team level, our goal is never to have a goal scored out of the center position. Their, your job at the center, as, as a center defender, is to take those exclusions. You don't, that's, it's a role, there's no goals out of the center position. Hasn't, doesn't always work, but it's a goal. Um, and then never allow the center to rest. Um, positioning. The foundation of all the defender's activities is positioning. Gaining and maintaining ball side position and still maintain contact with the center. The defender must know their position in front of the goal and always know the location of the ball. This one, and it's like, the position in front of the goal is crucial. The goal could be another teammate. That a lot of people, if you're able to push 
if I'm defending Brenda and the goal is the table, and if she's center cage, two meter line, she's, this is good. I can't, I, I'm in trouble. But if I can get Brenda, I'm fronting, and Brenda gets out to the outside post, I don't need to try to refront. I don't need to front anymore. This post is now my other defender. I can sit here and push her towards the, the zone, and there's not a lot happening. And a lot of the times, a lot of our players, at a lot of different levels, it's we're supposed to front, we're fronting, we're fronting, and so I'm fighting for this front position. I get to this position, now the ball gets to three, and she has the whole entire ocean to work with in front of the cage. It's a quick exclusion. So knowing your location in the cage, use the post as an opportunity to keep them outside. They don't have a center. The center wants this. They're going to fight for this. If we can give them this, they don't have anything. Because then it's just, I'm staying separated. I'm not giving them my chest. I'm pushing. The zone doesn't have to work too hard. The ball comes in. I can just nice control. Still, we're going the other way. It's that we overcommit to that front because we're told front, 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 we're going to press, we're going to front. And you do that when you have a great opportunity of just keeping them outside that post. And then the ball. We have to, as a defender, you need to know where the ball is. A lot of times we're just watching the center this way. We're so zoned in on who we're guarding, 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 and we have no idea that the ball's sitting right behind our head. <laughs> Happens. Any questions so far? Um, base position for the defender. Your body is in a horizontal position. You don't want to be vertical. You want to maintain an arm length distance away from the center. You don't want to give them your chest. As we talked with the centers, they want your chest. If you give them their, your body to work with, they can fill you in which way you're going to be moving. If I can stay away and I can hit and hit and hit, then I can react to that ball or I can come in control with wide arms. It's, that's ideal because then it, you're more mobile and you're harder to read. You do, you do lunge forward with wide arms when that ball comes in, especially if you have a crash coming in. I'm just going to control with wide strokes and wait for that, your teammate to steal that ball. Um, you're going to maintain contact with the center and know where the ball is at all times. That maintaining, it could just be a hand check. You're going to be always having one hand on there and knowing what the situation is. And you've got to have your head on the swivel so you can always know where the ball is. Um, some techniques for fronting. So one of the ones is swimming around. On swimming around, you're going to use four quick strokes. And it's to, it's to help you move and also to break a, a high hold. So if Brenda's going to guard me, or be the center, and she's holding here in that seat position, I have front position this way. I have a sideline, my hips are up, I'm ready to move, but she's got a hold of me. And so instead of going this way or spinning the break, you can spin if you have to stay behind or trying to get behind. But if I want to try to maintain the front position because she has deep, she's in the two meter line, I can just take a quick four quick strokes, break that hold, and reposition. So it's just a nice, it's like almost like a little karate chop, break the hold so you can move and then keep your separation and still maintain the front. On the same, on the, along the same thing is like if Brent is like more active, there's more active players that move a lot more so you can't really necessarily lose and stay away and swim this way. So you're going to do more of where you can always have contact. So it's a one arm swim. So I'm always going to have at least one hand on the center. So she's here, she's moving a lot, but I always have an idea where she's at, but I can stay away and like hit and move this way. So you're always having that contact, because smaller, more active centers, bigger defender, you're going to lose them, and then they're going to be wide open. So this way you have some idea what, where they're going, and you can hang on to them. <coughs> um, spinning is another way of just maintaining, like, um, I'm not really good at this. I was never really good at spinning because I was bigger. But the smaller players, they're so mobile, they're able to do it. So like Maggie Steffens, when she was defending in 2012, like at the Olympics, she was, it's just you're spinning in and you're giving your back to the center. You're square to the ball and then you're snapping away. So you're using a combination of the spin. And with that, there's, you can spin if the center is holding, like you have like a low suit grab. So Either they're holding you, your hips are down, you're out of position, but I'm still in front, but you're worried about being able to move. It's the same, you can spin and break the arm. So you can spin back towards, like a bear roll, hit the wrist, break the hold, reposition.
position in your back and front so then you're in your base position. But that barrel roll isn't up and out of the water or on top of it. It's just really stationary, quick turn in the water to break that hold. Any questions? How do you kind of communicate or teach kids how, how to communicate with the ref, you know, with their hands that they're, that they're not holding? Or, you know, what are the key ways to teach a defender to communicate with the ref, you know, when to show their hands? Um, I don't know if you teach them to communicate with the ref. I think it's more on your body <coughs> position. A lot of kids, when they're guarding, in a natural, natural resting point, they rest their hand like this on top of the shoulder. And so even if I like all of a sudden my, put my hand up like this when the ball comes in, this is what the referee is seeing for like 20 seconds. And so this is the initial, and if that center like tries to snap or like they don't move very far, and it's just that referee seeing this for 20 seconds. So a lot of your positioning like as a defender is gonna be the lot area. You want in this position, you don't wanna be up here. So if I can defend, here and I'm fronting, or if I'm behind and I'm hitting, it's in the lat. And then when I go forward, I don't go up and out. I have to go along the plane of the water and hit. Because then it's not dumping. So everything is wide and not here. So then, and then showing your hands a little bit more. So like if you're staying behind, you can put a hand up and then hit and switch hands. So then the referee's always gonna see one hand and then when the ball comes in, utilizing your legs with a big breaststroke kick to get your chest to your back. Does that answer that? Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Um, just important factors that as a defender you need to kind of have a general idea. Is the center left-handed or right-handed? Because that's going to dictate which positioning is more important to cover towards the shooting. Location of the ball and the position of the center in relationship to the goal. So then like using that goal it, like is going to help you dictate what's going to happen. Um, the center entry pass, the location, your relationship with the goalkeeper and the field players is crucial. So we talked about a little bit with the skip pass for the center to get the great pass in the center. You as a defender, you don't want that skip pass. You can't. So you have to rely and you have the faith in your field players to be pressing and be in proper press, press position. So that ball has to move from position to position. So that gives me a second to reposition and have my front positioning. And being able to have that second is important. And then knowing, so I'm in good press positioning, is knowing the fact that I'm not just going to be up in the lane. But when my player gets the ball, it's not going to be a quick foul because then that's a free pass, it's going to be pressure on the ball for a long, like, as long as they can. So then that gives that defender just that little bit of extra time to reposition and be in proper front position. Um, exclusions to prevent a goal is a defender's job. And that's something that we have to teach the kids early on because it's the, the bummed expression of being a defender and then getting that quick exclusion and it's something that you, we just have to touch on a little bit to make sure that they're, they know what their role is on that. And then you really, as a defender, you don't want to give up a penalty shot. Take the exclusion early on. Don't give them the opportunity to draw that penalty. Um, mental toughness. We talked on this a little bit earlier. The defender should have intense concentration throughout the game. It's a, full, it's a hard job. As a defender, you have the responsibility of trying to take care of probably like the offensive court, like it, they, the coordinator of the offense is the center position. And so you have that responsibility. It's always great. And I think one of our strengths on the national team is we always have four or five defenders that, and they're all different. So it's like a tag team. Like we have someone that's super strong. We have someone that's really mobile. And so it's like the centers never get like a keyed in on certain people. So it's like you get the, it's a constant tag team of, oh, this person, oh, I, who do you want to match up with and stuff. So it's, it's a hard job, but it's, you have to be focused the whole entire time. Um, and then the ability to handle adversity. You, you're going to have bad calls. It's just going to be the flow of the game, the referee. It's they, this, we had a call at the other end or whatever the situation, there's going to be bad calls and you're going to get excluded. Um, physical play. Sometimes it's you're the, at the wrong end of the stick on the physical play. The referee saw the end part of it or whatever. You just kind of have to 
take your exclusion, go to the corner, regroup, and then come play in the now, flush it from this morning. And, and then the position itself is just, it's something that it's, it's not a very glorified position. It's not the focal point, and so, but it's a crucial point to the game. And that's my slideshow. snapping up and out and you're getting that separation going that way. Another, it's, it, 
is just the repetition of not having something to snap off of. So just doing laps. So like with the senior team, like they, it's there when we do center work, which we do, some, we try to do center work at least three times a week, because it's an area and it's both defensively and centers. They need time. You have to work on it. It can't be something that like the game starts and you expect them to be able to do these things. These are skills that it's important that you do and they have that comfort. It's a comfort. In those two positions, you need to be comfort, comfort, comfortable doing what you're doing instead of just kind of like on the fly a little bit. But it's laps. You can, I mean, towards the end, you put weight belts on them and it's like late work, but it's like you start in your base position, you have a ball in front and you just snap. And you have to try to cover water and it's like it really focuses them knowing what their legs are going to do. Because a lot of times it's like when they snap to the ball, they're not necessarily snapping with their legs. It's, it's with the arm. They're like just like this and they're over... So now they're like this, and they have no mobility or legs to move. And so just making sure, because you want to have high knees in that base position. And so you're snapping and scooping. So your right leg is coming out and scooping that water, dragging your chair with you so you're in that base position. So it could just be a lapse of doing that repetition-wise and covering.
things that we wanted to do today uh, with having Brenda with us um, and Heather <coughs> as well uh, is to take advantage of, of their experiences, obviously recently in London, uh, winning the gold, and then also uh, just their, their experiences as athletes uh, and uh, uh, maybe their perspective on coaching uh, from, from, uh, from the athlete point of view. We were also obviously on your papers, so, uh, Ryan Bailey was going to be with us uh, during this time, but uh, uh, Yovan did not want to move practice uh, right now, so he's actually in the water as we speak, training uh, right now with the national team. So, um, but in those last 20 minutes or so, uh, we can just kind of open up the floor, no, no PowerPoint, but just to ask some questions about anything while we have uh, these two phenomenal women with us uh, in the room. So. Shooting over defenders? Yeah. Or around them? Around, well, we do a drill of um, going around the horn, so you're just like a two player drop. Right. So you get to move with the teammate and move into a shooting lane. You can create a lane to pass them into set because it's not just you and a shot block defender. It's, right. Can I get them to commit to me so I can put it in? Or are they staying back? Do I move? Do I move goal? Do my teammates assist me? It's hardly ever a one player drop unless you're at five. And Probably we're just gonna make the most of that shot. But I think you know, if you go around the perimeter, you go one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, and it's a great drill even to get to know your centers, to really want the ball, and then just helping um, to win your teammates. Like, you know, I like to catch the shoe, like where you place the ball to be shot by Can you guys hear okay for your microphones for if you could use the microphone for me, that'd be good. Yeah. As as veterans or you know player coaches. I mean, she's a phenomenal player, scorer. I mean, I think on our team we were lucky because you could have received that production from anybody. Opening game, I think Courtney Matthewson had four goals. And if you think of Courtney again at Pan Am final against Canada, she brought us back from being down 7-3. And I think that was one of our strengths. And Adam did a great job of, you know, getting 13 players that could play different roles on any given day. And I think the team saw that she was on fire, and if she was open, why not keep feeding that fire? So, I mean, we weren't surprised, but I think it, the beauty of our team is it could have been anybody. I think the preparation leading up to the Olympics like, was making sure that every athlete was ready to go. So even if like the veterans who had been there, like we made sure that everyone was prepared for whatever was going to be happening. So like every scenario, like the village, like we had a great opportunity to go to the venue before like the competition, they had a test event. So like we got to go to the pool, we got to play in the pool, we got to see everything. And so we had that great like opportunity to so then like even our first start, first time Olympians were able to go and compete at a level and be comfortable. And just within the system of play, it, as Brenda said, it could really be anybody Scoring those goals, it just depends on who's in that position. Do you ever run a, um, you ever run a, uh, a double, double center on offense? And, and when would you do that? Well, we... We do that in masters sometimes. <laughs> well, we would use that mostly when our centers weren't in. So we have like a havoc sort of offense where if we're trying to attack a specific player on the opposing team, you go in from anywhere. Anytime you're guarding the other team's center, you're taking them to the two. Or if you want a more active offense because the referees are rewarding post-ups, then you're going to switch it up and go to that. So we kind of did that periodically throughout the Olympics. So we hardly ever go into a double post when we have Cammy Krager on Idris in there because we want them to go to work. So if they're not in, if they're in ejection trouble, then we can switch it up and go to a double post. But it's not a double post for 30 seconds. It's uh, someone's in their slides over, another post up comes in, and you kind of decide who has better position. So sort of that, yeah, everybody should be able to play every position at least for a little while if the situation just happens to favor that. You should be able to 
Yes. And, we do that for a few seconds for the team. and we prepare for that. So we in practice we go over that. There'll be times where I have to go in there and take someone in there, and I'm not a center, but you have to be able to do that for a possession if that's what the team needs. Besides the gold medal match, that I think would be the best match you've had in like the tournament. What game did you really like and really said, man, after this game, we're really not going to stop? What game? I mean, there was a tie, but I don't even think. Well, I think the tie kind of just lit our fire a little more. We gave up a three goal lead, and we were like, are you kidding me? Like, we got a shot at Spain earlier in the year. They beat us. We hadn't seen them in four years. So we get our second shot at them. We lose a three-goal lead, and we're like, no, no, no. This is not going to happen again. So it just, I think, sharpened our focus a little bit more in London. But I would say the, the semifinal game. You like that one more? Yeah, I mean, there was whatever timeout, whatever happened. Like, if you saw the team, it didn't affect us in any way. Like we were going to handle our business, and, and we did. And I think that just carried over, and I think – it's a tribute to our coaching staff because that was something that I think a lot of teams maybe could have crumbled under. Like, I don't even think we realized, or I didn't, that that was a coaching error. To me, it was like, oh, they don't want us to win. We're getting screwed. Like, we're going to take that back into, you know, what we can control. So when overtime comes around, we're just going to make sure we do what we've trained to do the whole year. I mean, I think for the edification of the – oh, sorry, Mr. Sama, go ahead. No. Um, well, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the two of you have been a part of the national team program for a long time, and I'd say probably in this last Olympics, had a lot of younger players that all of a sudden are coming into the program and, and are now your teammates, and how do you two as older, more veteran players – bring the younger players up to speed and make them really feel like they're, they're a part of the team. Um, because sometimes that, that can be a very difficult part of the process with older players, and, and especially when it comes down to making cuts of some of some people you've played with for a long time, and we're going to go with some of the younger players, and, and how you kind of settle the dust there with maybe some other teammates, or, and, and then again, especially with, with getting the younger players up to speed and making them feel, feel great about being here. Well, I think – after Shanghai, where we play sixth place, um, that was a wake-up call for us, and we realized that we weren't meshing as well, like the experienced players with the younger players, and we knew we needed to do that if we were going to be successful in London. So it was actually, there was a group of the in-betweeners, so like say Cami Craig, who had been to an Olympics but isn't quite one of the youngest, but is there. She actually initiated this thing where we had to spend, had to, but we chose to spend time with each other out of the water so that we were really getting to know our teammates in and out of the water. And Adam was a big, he was a big advocate of the more you care and you spend time with your teammates, the more you're going to fight for them in the water. So we really took it to another level and made sure that that happened. And in an interview, someone asked me, you know, your team looks so united. Like, is that real? Is it real? Like, do you guys still talk to each other now? And and it was real, and I think that's why it made it so much, or it was that special in London where we have PD that had a concussion at the beginning of the tournament. No one knew that. She didn't play two games. We had Courtney that was kind of injured, and we went through so many things, even that time out, but we were able to fight through all of that and still deliver a performance in the championship game. So I think making sure that we all shared the same vision and that we were all invested in the same way out of the water and in the water really helped merge the youngsters with the veterans. The other aspect that was really focused on is making sure that everyone had a voice. There was, it, there wasn't just, there was tons of team activities at the pool. Uh, the sports psychologist, Peter, he'd come in and facilitate a lot of things where it's like, it just, it, it makes you think and like, you have to talk and you hear other people's opinions and it kind of just makes you see someone and learn someone's different values or whatever if they're different from you and just learning that whole aspect at the pool and making sure that everyone felt comfortable having a voice. Adam was a big advocate on making sure that every single person at the pool from our starting squad of 25 people, they each had a role within the team of being a leader. 
I mean, you have different leaders amongst the team in the pool. It wasn't just a captain on the team and that captain dictates everything, but everyone in the pool had a role and had a voice in making sure that you felt like you could lead in a certain situation. So even with Maggie being the youngest person on the team, she would lead some of the conversations during these opportunities of team bonding and stuff. So making sure it's just that comfort level. So then you learn to not necessarily look at the, the returners and the newbies, it just became a team. And that's what you're, that's how you, you win as a team. You don't win as an individual. You don't win as, oh, well, these six players went to the Olympics before and these ones are new. It, it's us coming together as 13 people to be successful as a team. Well, I always like to bring it back from it's not a violent sport, it's the toughest sport out there to play. And I want to encourage parents to get their little girls into the sport of water polo. So whenever I could say it's not violent, and it may look that way because there's the underwater cameras and the splashing and the suit grabbing, but it's not violent. It's tough and it's physical like any other sport. And basketball, you have people like jerseys, people grab jerseys all the time, but just because you're not exposing something. So just, I always like to say it looks dirtier and more physical than it actually is. It's a tough sport, and if you're a tough kid, you should try out for water polo. Oh, he did some of those hockey moves. You can run carded all the time if you pull that off the water polo. <laughs> actually, that's a lot dirtier sport. So, <clears throat> I want to ask you, Brenda, just for the education of, of our group at, or as a coach's association, like, you, you played for a lot of uh, different coaches. You, you played on a lot of levels. Played internationally too, professionally, not just for the national team as well. Like, what do you? What are some of the qualities that you look for in a coach? Like, what are like the best coaches you've had? You've had a lot of different coaches, but like, what are some of the qualities that you look for in, in the coaches that you took the most out of? Well, whether it was the Italian coach that I played for, or my college coach, or the national team coaches, you could tell when coaches are prepared and when they come to practice and it's thought out and the week's thought out and you know that everything you're doing is going to make you better to play whether six on five, five on six, whatever it is. And as an elite athlete, you appreciate that because you know that you only have a certain amount of time in the water, so you're gonna make the most out of everything. But it's also, or the coaches that I've liked the most, they're, they're great communicators because they can explain their vision and they aren't afraid to answer questions when you ask questions. I feel like a lot of times coaches are set in certain ways and you ask why, and they're like, this is just the way it is. But some people like to think about the process and the steps to get there. So having that kind of dialogue, those are the coaches that I like. I like to go sit in a coach's office. Like I sat in JT's office. I mean, I should have been doing my schoolwork, I think, but I was in there a lot of time just talking water polo. So if your athletes want to do that with you, that's, I mean, that's what makes, I think, a great coach. And a coach that is passionate, a coach that um, can really get his players or her players to believe in the vision is something that is really, really important. And you need to be able to communicate that vision clearly. So those are just a few things that, when I think of the great coaches that I've had, and you know, I like structure, I like routine. So if you can lay out a month for me and tell me what I'm going to be doing, then I can mentally prepare. Like I said, this is one of the toughest sports out there. So you need to be able to mentally prepare before you go to practice, whether it's today it's all conditioning. I can do that. If today I need to think a little more because I've got to you know, put on my thinking water polo cap, then that's what I'll do. But if you can be prepared as a coach, athletes really, really appreciate that. I am 
coaching, or I coached a high school girls team in the fall, and I think I give coaches a lot more credit now. Yes. <laughs> um, I know that there's certain things that I want to change, but I think I need to find my own coaching, I guess, voice. I think that I have, like, Guy, Adam, JT, everyone in there, and the way I've been programmed to think for so long. So now it's like, okay, what do I want to teach? How do I want to teach it? What's the most effective way to teach it? And I want to be a mentor to these kids. And I think that's another great quality of a coach is coaches that you can look up to and you respect and they lead by example, their own, like their own personal life. So that's what I want to do in my coaching philosophy. So I'm still trying to kind of put that all together so that I'm a good coach. <laughs> I don't know if it's what someone said, but I think the opportunity that I got to play co-ed for so long, I think helped me develop into the player that I am. And I had to play on the boys' high school team, but since you know, age eight I, to 14, I was playing against boys. So it was always, what do you have to do? Because at 13, they get, they're taller and they're faster than you, so I have to be smarter. Like, how do I anticipate? How do I can still beat them? And it just, there was this competitive drive that was developed in me because I was eight and I was better than these boys, but then by the time they were 13, they were physically bigger and better than me, but I still wanted to be better than them. So I don't think anything was said, but I was just, I had so many opportunities to play so many games from an early age, and I think that's what helped me develop into a good water polo player. And that was a long time ago, so I'm sure something was said to me, but. <laughs> Well, and I think I was just taught to me that it's okay to be aggressive, and I think that's something that it's hard to teach to a 10-year-old girl, like the contact and be physical and be aggressive, it's okay. And I think because I had to play with the boys, that just developed, and it was like, okay, let's go. I don't care that you're a boy. I want to beat you. question. Um, I retired after 04 and transitioned into coaching right away in 05. I was the interim head coach at the World Championships in Canada in 05. And I think I took a lot of being Brenda's teammate and other players in that situation. And I think it was more of a team attack. Um, they were able to help me be comfortable in the coaching position and it was really an open line of communication, especially in that first year of transitioning. I really relied on a lot of my teammates because that's what I was used to doing. You know, it's, you're used to having them in the pool. And I think when it transitioned, it, we just, it was really good because it was a, a collaboration of making sure that things were being covered that needed to be covered. And I think the lead up, because back in 2000 and when we were starting, we had to do a lot of pace clinics. And so in those pace clinics, it forced us to teach the game. And so, and that's one of the things I contribute to me being able to coach now is the fact that as a player, I had to learn to teach it to all different kinds of kids. And uh, you were in the water with them and then finding the right words that they would understand. So it's like you can talk to elite athletes at one level, but then when you're in the pool with eight-year-olds, it's different and you have to change your verbiage a little bit and make it fun and make sure that they're engaged. And I think that was the lead up. So I had that base there and then just utilizing my teammates 
in that standpoint of helping the transition. And like even, I was with John and Brenda and I were talking before we started, and even this year, I use Brenda and I use Pete a lot for coaches' development. Because it's like, they, she has no problem coming to me and going, what are you doing? Like, what's this? Why are you doing this? Like, you need to kind of step in and this is an area you need to focus on. And it's, it's that open line of communication and I think that's really been helpful for my development as a coach. It was very interesting when you talked about the different styles from some of the different nations. How, how as coaches and, and players did you prepare for those different styles? Was it you would simulate it with uh, players to play that role or would you watch film or how, how, how did you adjust? It was a combination. I think um, if you have teams in the area that can come in and you can scrimmage against them that are bigger and stronger and faster. So like if you're playing the Dutch, then that's usually their MO. So you can bring in a high school team and you can scrimmage them a bunch of like boys, then that's an opportunity. Um, but uh, really this last getting ready for in London, it was a lot of video. We took a lot of um, video, we game breaker clips, looking at specific things with the defenders and the centers. Dan would take the defenders on one day for like 20 minutes and just kind of have like 10 clips that they would walk through and talk about certain scenarios and explain and it was an open line of communication. And I did that with Ani and Cami in the center position. So it's just very isolated position work and it's a video right there and you can, it's visually and you have an open line of communication with those athletes and it was something that really got you dialed in on, especially on certain teams and certain techniques in those positions.
I just want to thank uh, Brenda and Heather again for uh, <laughs>